All right, we're going to look at some slicer settings today. So I've got Cura open. Uh, we're just going to, we might have talked about some of these before, uh, every, here and there, um, or we might have used some of them. I think we've used maybe one of them for sure, but the others I don't know if we've used. And these are more like, not like layer thickness or printing temperature or number of walls. You know, these are the ones that you don't often, you may not even know they exist in the slide. There are, there are hundreds of different settings that you can dig through in here, uh, in Cura or in other, any other slicer. Um, I'm going to stick to Cura for this one. Um, these slicer settings exist in other slicers. They just might have different names um, or they might have the same name. Uh, before we do that, I did want to show you where we are on painting things. I haven't done a whole lot, but uh, finished this guy up. I did get the ebony rub and buff in. So that's uh, similar to how we made the, the silver-ish color over here on our um, what's a flash suppressor, I suppose is what that's called. Um, but this guy, pretty much the same. I didn't go back and add a lot of um, dark color in the grooves here. It might could have used that, but what I did do is I coated it with this uh, lacquer overcoat. It is a gloss overcoat. Um, but I didn't spray it on very thick, so it didn't get uh, too, it didn't get built up too much, and it's not shiny. It's got a nice satin finish to it, so I kind of like where this ended up. It looks as good as, you know, what I think a plastic piece that I did could look at as far as uh, wood goes. Uh, so I think we'll stop there. I have over on the side, I've got other pieces mounted up ready to paint some primer on and get them ready to go. This stuff, what I plan to do with it is, see how it's uh, got some darker color? This one was uh, primed in a dark, like a black almost primer. Um, actually, uh, and, and then I did paint some black paint on top of it. Um, and so I wanted a little bit more of the black showing through here. So I've already done a little bit. But I'll just do a little more to show you, basically. Yes, you don't need a lot of this stuff although this you do need more of it than you did of the silver the silver you didn't need much at all um, this stuff doesn't seem to be quite as um, I don't know it didn't flow out as well I guess I don't know why you could say it but uh, it seems to be a little more chalky maybe that's the way to put it but this is kind of what I wanted to go for with it is to put something that and I don't know if blasters have soot associated with them or not but this one does so I wanted to put a little more of something that might remind me of uh, some soot around these base down here and just kind of blend it in with the silver I already had. I might, I don't know yet, might go back and add some more silver to it, but kind of something like that just to get a little bit more variation in the color out of it. In general, if you're trying to make something look older, um, and used, then you want lots of different variations in color um, because they aren't new anymore and so they're not solid colors anymore. Uh, and so they've acquired all kinds of dirt and grime and everything like that that uh, kind of affects their colors. So I kind of want to do something like that, actually maybe just like that. Um, and this stuff works pretty well for that. There are plenty of other things that you could do. I just wanted to try this because I haven't tried it before. I will say I don't like it as much as I liked the silver rub and buff um, it is at least this bottle so far well two um, and i haven't used much of it at all is more chalky and it doesn't spread out as evenly and as smoothly as like the silver did but i do like the effect it gives so uh we'll we'll carry on with that i don't know if i'll add any more to this piece or not uh, most of the rest of the body of everything else for the blaster is just black i probably will paint that uh black and um, then add some silver, like places on the corners where it's run uh, into something and maybe chipped off the paint or something like that. Um, but I haven't gotten to that yet. So basically these are the pieces that we've painted and are ready to go into assembly of the other pieces. We just gotta get the other pieces ready. So that's where we're at on that. Haven't done a whole lot um, with that. Let's go back to Cura and talk about some of these uh, slicer settings that you might have used. You might might solve the problem you're having uh, as far as getting something to stick or print the way you want it or whatever. Um, and one of them we have talked about 
um, we actually need a part in here. I, I downloaded two. I downloaded our um, little coin that we used a while back. It'll be useful for one of a couple of the samples. And then I found a Pikachu uh, that will be useful. Um, neither one of them will actually make sense for this next one, but uh, let's just pick one. Let's pick this guy. <clears throat> so he's actually really large, I guess. But uh, we're not going to actually print it, at least not right now. Um, so if you're having trouble with things holding down to the build plate, so and you've done all the regular stuff, you've, you've made sure your bed is as level as it can be, you've tweaked the nozzle height off of the surface, maybe you've turned on baby stepping so that as it's printing you can uh, change the height of the nozzle away from or closer to the bed. Um, one thing that you can do that you might not have thought about is let's go to support not support uh build plate adhesion down here so these are in the i guess i'm in the standard uh settings here i don't know if these are the advanced settings or not i've added so many that i don't they're not the recommended ones so they're some of the advanced i guess they have it in different levels i don't know which one i'm even in right now um but in build plate adhesion one thing there's each one of these has a purpose that is a little bit different from the others so skirt is the one where let's slice him so that you can see the skirt i might should have picked a model that's actually let's because it's going to take long to slice him let's let's just use the little coin it wouldn't need this but um it'll it'll help it explain what we're doing so skirt so that slice is much faster. Let's preview it. And so that these little lines outside here, that's the skirt. And um, they do at least two things. They might do more, but one thing they do is they purge the nozzle. So usually you have a little purge line off to the side anyway. But um, the other thing that these can do is as it's printing, now I have mine set up to print three skirt layers around it, um, which you can, you can go in and change. Um, the number you'd have to go to skirt and then there's the uh, different settings related to uh, skirt line width skirt brim line width um, line count is the one that I might change um, and maybe even the distance so this distance is how far away from the outside of the model is it so I've got it set to be a centimeter away um, and you could pull it in closer or make it go further out, whichever makes sense to you. But um, you might change the number of line counts if you need more time to do this. So what you might do is watch this skirt as it prints and you can individually adjust the bed knobs, you know, so the raise a corner or lower a corner as this thing is printing um, so that you can get the bed level during the print process. Maybe there's some reason that it's um, not level at the, you know, it may be the last part you took off, you had to uh, scrape on the bed a little bit much and it jostled it out of being level. Um, so you can do this. Sometimes you can do it with just the three, you know, or two, however, whatever you have turned on, but um, you might need a few more rounds around the thing particularly if it's small like this this is pretty small so it's not going to take it very long to print those three um, but it gives you an idea of the the area where you're about to print this part if that area is level or not and so maybe your parts are being printed in just one corner um, you know maybe you've moved it over to one side for some reason and uh, now when you slice it it'll give that uh, skirt over here near this corner and you can kind of get it adjusted uh, as good as it possibly can be before the part starts printing. So that's one thing the skirt does. Um, there were others though. So where are we at in build plate adhesion? Here it is. So brim, this is similar to a skirt except it physically attaches to the part. So well, let's, let's just turn on the brim and show you. So see how it's actually connected to it. Um, so it, it also purges, but the main point here is that um, this will help hold down the part. So if you have a part that has a really small connection point to the uh, bed and you're afraid it's going to break off, or maybe you printed it a couple of times and it has broken off during the print, um, this brim can help with that. 
if you're having warping issues, like a corner is peeling up because you've got a lot of material, maybe it's a, a, a wall that's relatively thin but uh, tall, and so there's a lot of material over that one particular spot uh, that's being heated and cooled over and over again, um, and it wants to peel up. If you put this brim on here, then if that starts to happen, you can actually go in and get a piece of tape, masking tape, uh, blue painters tape, whatever, and tape that brim back down. So it gives you a part to hold on to, uh, to get the print to finish before uh, it has warped completely off the bed. Um, the one I don't like to use, but is sometimes necessary, particularly for small parts. If you're printing really small things that just won't stick on the bed because there's nothing to them, you know, they're really tiny, is to print on a raft. So a raft will actually print an entire however many layers. In this case, I've got it set to three, I think. No, four. I've got four layers underneath it. So it prints basically a platform for the part to print on. Um, if you're having really bad issues with warping and things being unlevel, or maybe your bed is just not flat, um, you can print a raft, but it's generally going to significantly increase the print time uh, because it's, you know, it's adding solid, almost solid. They're not totally solid. Let's look at them. So the first two are pretty coarse and then they get more solid uh, layers underneath the part, everywhere underneath the part. So however big the part is, it's going to be bigger than that and four layers underneath it. Or you can set it to different numbers of layers, but less than four probably is not going to gain you much. It's, it's not going to do too well. Um, you might get away with three. But uh, this does a couple of things. For one, it will help um, little tiny parts stick to that raft. So it, it might make them hard to remove from the raft, but um, they will stick down to it pretty well. It also levels out all these uneven uh, features in your bed. Maybe you have got a hole somewhere in your bed, not a hole, but a dip in your bed or, or a little hill somewhere in your bed. It'll help, help level all that stuff out. Um, but it does add a lot of time to printing in general. Um, so those we've kind of talked about, uh, we haven't actually gone in and explained why you might use one or the other. Um, in general, I just leave the skirt um, and I use it mainly as a purge and as a, um, like a visual indicator that I can look at and see, oh, that corner's too close uh, because the skirt is not printing or maybe it's uh, really, really thin. If the, if the filament is transparent, and it's not supposed to be, you know, it's not a translucent filament. Um, if it's printing and it's so thin that you can see through it, you're, you're probably too close on that corner or that edge and you need to lower the bed a little bit by turning the knobs on the bed. Um, so those are a couple of things. Um, let's, let's get rid of this guy because it won't help with our next one. Uh, let's, and we have talked about this one. I do remember talking about this one, but uh, we'll, we'll since we're talking about slicer settings, we'll, we'll put it in there anyway. Let's actually change our layer height to something a little bit bigger so it doesn't take quite as long to uh, slice this guy. So let's slice him. Um, I believe, yes, supports are turned on. So let's see what we get. And then let's preview. So four and a half hours, or yeah, four and a half hours, more or less. And we get a couple of little supports. These supports over here, you know, that's that's not too steep. I think my printer can handle that uh, without these supports. And there's a high, high chance that these would break off anyway. These would actually be a good case for, oh, the raft is still turned on, I think. Um, so you can see the raft underneath him. Um, but I think there's probably a good chance that these would break off. So one thing you could do here um, if you really wanted to keep these tiny supports over here is you could go in and uh, no, it does not. This must be supports. Oh, it must not be flat on the bottom. Um, you could go and add the brim to your model and make sure that it's large enough. Let's look at our brim settings. Um, it's currently it's at four millimeters. I didn't measure, but let's and with, oh, that's the line count let's see it actually 10 might be enough let's slice it and see so what I want is that brim to be out far enough to actually help hold down those little tiny supports you 
Yeah. So see now, those supports aren't just sticking to the bed. They've got all this brim to help hold them down. Now there's still going to be a good chance that they're going to fail because they're they're pretty thin and they're probably a little bit wobbly as they get taller and taller. I mean, it won't take much for the nozzle to knock them over if it accidentally bumps into them or has a, a little blob of filament hanging on it. So it might be better to just not print them at all um, because if they are here and they do fail, then they might fail in a way to where uh, they just land off to the side and they're not interfering with the print, but they also might fail in a way where they stick to the nozzle or they get stuck in the model or, you know, and they maybe not ruin the model, but they at least create extra post-processing work. So you might want to just remove them entirely. So you, with keeping the other supports where they are. So you have over here support blocker, and we have looked at this before, but uh, I want to go ahead and show how it works again, because we're going to use this for some other features here in a second. So um, what this does is it creates a block. And you can resize this block. Well, click on the block. Uh, we can re well, we can move it around. Uh, basically, anywhere you don't want support to exist, you cover it up with one of these support. You cover the top of it, so the parts that you don't want the support to go and touch. So I, it was basically right here. It looks like I need to make it a little bigger, though. Um, probably turn off uniform scaling so that you can scale it in uh, a couple of directions at once without scaling the whole thing maybe even make it a little bit that's probably good so now you know, let's make it tall go ahead and cover up there weren't any supports maybe they were touching here and here so those areas look like they're covered um, now when we slice supports are still turned on but i've got this support blocker in place and i still have the brim turned on so it'll put a brim down there uh, and we have to preview it to see them now those supports don't even exist, so they certainly won't be a problem now, assuming that you know I'm correct that my printer is able to print this angle here, which I think it is. Um, you know, you might do a, these other angles. You might say that uh, his whole face here might not need them. I don't know. I didn't look closely at it. Um, the tail looks like it probably will need them, um, and this ear probably does look... Uh, Deep or shallow enough that it's going to need support. Um, speaking of this tail, let's go back to it. So this tail is a little bit thin, and it has a you know relatively small connection point over here. Um, so I probably, for it to be strong, I want to have a uh, pretty high density infill there. So like maybe 50%. So if I go to 50%, Turn off the brim, or well, we don't need the brim. Where's it at? Go ahead and go back to our skirt. All right, so if I go to infill and set it to 50%, what I think is going to be make it more or less solid. So we'll slice that. I don't know what I'm on a cubic infill pattern, but um, you could have whatever zigzag or rectilinear or whatever grid. So five hours, 40 minutes. Oh, and I'm at a 0.3 layer height. So I might would actually print this at a thinner layer height, although it's pretty big. So 0.3 might be about what I'd do. Uh, but let's look inside. We still have our support in place. So it's pretty dense. I don't need all of this density inside the bulk of the model, but it does come in and it makes the tail pretty solid. I might even want it a little more solid than that. You know, it's still got some hollow, a little bit of hollow to it. Um, but I'm already at nearly six hours of printing time, and a lot of this I'm pretty sure I don't need to be so dense. Like, I don't need the inside of this model to be so dense. So we can go back to those support blockers, and um, instead of using them as a support blocker, use them as a, a localized modifier. So I'll put one of these over on the tail and basically make it cover the entire tail. So we'll scale it and move it around. Let's scale it first. Um, uniform is off, so we got to make it much taller. 
and a good bit wider and a little bit thicker. All right, so let's move it to where um, it covers all of the tail and some of where it's connecting. So let's maybe move it back. You could rotate it even. We could, you know, oh, wait, can you not rotate? You may not can rotate uh, the support blockers. They may have to stay. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, you can rotate them. It's just for whatever reason, rotating only in certain increments. There we go. That actually looks like it might be pretty good. Move it over a little bit. So all the tail is encapsulated in a support blocker. Well, let's actually move it this way a little bit and make it a little bit bigger in that direction. There we go. So now all the tail is encapsulated and the part where it's connected to the thing. Now, um, if I go to this per model setting over here, I've got a uh, normal model, print and support, modify settings for overlaps and then don't support overlap. So the normal thing is uh, a support blocker, but I could change it into modify the settings for, for where this blocker overlaps the model. I wanna do that. And I can change, it's, basically it comes with a couple of things. It's either infill, mesh, cutting mesh, just leave it on there. Um, but I can select the settings I want to change. So I want to select uh, infill and so I just typed in infill and then it'll bring up the different things. I could change the speed or the pattern. I'm interested in the density. So I'm going to change the infill density and let's make it, let's go ahead and make it 75%. Um, so pretty much solid. So now where this blocker overlaps the model, so basically the tail and back here where it connects to the tail, um, that will be the higher percentage and I can go to the bulk model over here and change that infill down to maybe 15% or so. So maybe not even that much, we'll leave it at 15. And let's slice it now. We were at five hours, 40 minutes to make the whole thing, I think 50%. <clears throat> Still taking a while to slice. All right, we're actually faster by nearly an hour, over an hour. And let's see what our model looks like now. I didn't look at the amount of material being used. So now I have, remember I had a 75% on the tail. So a solid tail basically, solid, and a pretty sparse infill on the model, which is gonna be plenty. I've got three walls on the thing. So most of the model, the, the body here is getting its strength from the walls. And then the infill is just surprising providing a little bit of rigidity, but the tail is pretty much 100% solid everywhere. Remember, this is just a support over here. So now I've got, and notice it's got that thicker infill where the tail connects to the body. So I've got a pretty well, right? It's only a few layers that it actually connects. Uh, looks like they're connected. You know, it's kind of, you can see the tail coming out there and that's it. So there's not a whole lot of connection between the tail and the body anyway. Um, but now at least I have a solid tail with a uh, pretty hollow inside and I saved an hour of printing time and some material. I don't know how much, I didn't look at how much material I saved. I wasn't too worried about that. I was more interested in saving the time. Um, so you can use these support blockers and you can use more than one. You could have different regions to have different, um, all sorts of different things. So let's, let's go back and see some of the other click on that guy. You could select, um, I don't think you would be very wise to select like layer height, um, at least the way I've got it oriented here, but there's another way to do that. Um, we've got print speeds, um, supports or not, uh, maybe that area is going to be a tree support. Um, I think you could probably do, maybe, maybe you couldn't do temperature or anything like that. Um, you could have more walls, maybe in a certain area that it's going to be weaker. You want to have more walls there or need to be stronger. You need more walls, um, horizontal expansion. So you could have some region that is tuned to be a little bit larger or smaller, um, because you're having trouble with a hole being too small or something in that, just that region. Um, you can print some parts faster, uh, or slower. 
So there's a couple of different things. Probably the most interesting one is the infield density. So you can have these different densities for parts of the model that um, you think need to be denser or less dense. We could have done the opposite where we made just the body the less dense part and the, the default be the more dense. <clears throat> All right, let's move on to some other ones. So we talked about support blocker. Um, in there was horizontal expansion. Uh, that doesn't relate to just these support blockers. Let's get rid of this guy. Um, let's look at expansion. So horizontal expansion, initial layer horizontal expansion, and whole horizontal expansion. Those are all, um, and there's some for support down here. I'm not too interested in that. Um, but these for the shell, so the actual outer perimeter of the model. Uh, these horizontal expansion will basically scale everything up or down, but it doesn't just make it some percent larger or smaller. Um, what it does is it looks at the perimeter and it will offset by some distance, some number of millimeters, whatever you put in here. Now you don't want a, uh, a large number, you know, maybe like half a millimeter is all you're really going to do. Um, because things are not usually off by that much. Um, but it will take the perimeter and uh, make it larger with a positive number, except that it's really an offset. So it actually, a positive number on this one actually makes holes smaller <laughs> because, well, let me, let me try and show you. So let's see. Let's draw a, uh, here's a hole we want to print. And um, I need a, well, we'll just draw a rectangle around it. So here's our model that we're trying to print, or one layer of our model we're trying to print. So a positive horizontal expansion will take all these perimeters. So this is a hole, this is our model. The walls are the blue part. A positive horizontal expansion will, will offset um, whatever number of millimeters. So again, you don't usually use much more than half a millimeter or so, but it'll offset these walls by a certain amount when it actually prints them. So it would print them out here, which makes sense for the uh, outer perimeter. You know, it's a positive number and it got bigger, but holes get offset towards the inside, right? So they would offset something like this. So they would offset to the inside. So that would be a positive horizontal expansion. Um, a negative number, so you could do the same thing, but with negative, it would make the outer parts offset towards the inside. So they would print as a, being a little bit smaller, like this, by whatever amount, you know, 0.5 millimeters or whatever you've trying to tweak your settings. Um, but the hole would actually get a little bit larger. Uh, find a larger one, there we go. So that would be a negative horizontal ex expansion. Um, so you can use this to um, kind of tweak the settings uh, to make your model uh, more accurate to what you, the printed model, more accurate to what you intended in the beginning. Um, they have a separate section just for holes. Now in, in this one, so you have to pay attention, the horizontal expansion without the word hole next to it uh, does what we just drew on the page. The whole horizontal expansion actually does the opposite. And it tells you, if you hover over here, it gives you a little synapsis of what it's talking about. So positive values increase the size of holes, negative values reduce the size of holes. This one, if I was gonna use one of these, it would probably be just this one. Um, because typically when you print a hole, they're a little bit like 2% too small compared to what you designed them to be because of like extrusion oozing into the hole a little bit. Um, and so I would probably uh, use just this whole horizontal expansion and increase it a tiny amount, 0.2 millimeters or something like that. Maybe not even that much. You'd have, you'd have to tweak these things. You have to figure out what your printer is doing, um, as far as making holes too small or, or if it's making them too large.
So this is a, a way to not have to go back and change up the entire model or, or even scale the entire model. You can scale just the holes to make them fit uh, what you want. Now it doesn't pick up holes correctly every time. Maybe you have something that it doesn't think is a hole, but it actually is. And so um, it works best when the holes are, are in the orientation here where uh, the, um, it's a, like a standing up versus a laying down horizontally one. Um, all right, let's see what else we have in here. Oh, this is an injury. Let's get rid of Poke uh, Pikachu here and let's go back to our coin. So there's a couple of these that the coin can show off. So with the coin, we could go in and, uh, you know, we could make a bunch of these and print them all, uh, individually. Um, that's fine, but, uh, there are a, a few downsides to doing that. So one, one good thing is that you get a whole bunch of them printed at one time. One downside is that if one of them fails, then there's a good chance that it comes loose or whatever. It's going to get drug into your others and you might have more than one fail. Another downside is that, um, if I filled up the whole plate, uh, you know, made a whole bunch of these things. I don't know how many can fit on here. So let's try 20 plus the four I already have. All right, so I've got a whole plate of these now. And let's slice it. Let's go ahead and, well, it's, it's thinking. There we go. Well, no, it's kind of hung up. <laughs> so we'll let it do its thing for a while. I don't know why it's, uh, gotten hung up. Maybe I've got too many models out there. We have to restart it. But anyway, there we go. It's, it's woken up now. Let's try and slice it all. Um, so what I was going to say is that, uh, it will start with one of these. I don't know which one it'll print first, but it'll print the bottom layer of one of them. And then it'll move over and print the bottom layer of another one. Let's, let's look at this. So the bottom layer looks like this. It prints one and then it moves over and prints one and another and another. And by the time it gets to printing the second layer of that first one, it is completely cooled. I mean, you might have the heated bed keeping it sort of heated, but it's had a lot of time to solidify and cool. And then you go dump new uh, hot material on top of that. You have a scenario that's generally not good for the very much cool whatever temperature your heated bed is at, maybe 50 or 60, um, but you're printing 200 degrees Celsius material on top of that. And so that's generally not going to be good. Uh, so one thing you can do to avoid that is print them one at a time, or you can print them one at a time, but have the whole uh, bed still filled. Wow, it's taking a long time to resolve these for some reason. I don't know why it is having such a tr problem with deleting them. <clears throat> Let's start a new project. Maybe we can uh, get it to get clear out the bed. Yes. <laughs> All right. So let's put one of them back in there. I'm not sure why it's got so much difficulty right now. All right, so I want to print more than one, but I want to print them sequentially. So let's make, let's just do four because for some reason it's having trouble right now. Um, so let's not 20, let's make three copies. We have four of these now. Over here in my settings, I can go in, maybe it's turn to that off, um, and look for sequential, so just SEQ, and there's a print sequence. This is in the special modes, and I can do all at once. That's the, how you normally print. Every layer gets printed in its entirety all at one time. Well, not all at one time, but it prints that whole layer before going to the next layer. Or you can print each model one at a time. Now, there are some limitations on this, but... Um, Right now we would have a failed print. So what we have, these gray boxes are basically where the 
uh, print head is going to have to exist. Uh, you know, it's going to move around. And so it's given some area around it that you don't need any of your models to exist in any of the other models dark area. So we have, kind of have to spread them out a little bit. So if we spread it out, let's just put one. You, you can have them, the gray areas overlap. Like right now it would be okay. It would be really close right here in this dark circle around it. That's because I have the uh, skirt turned on. So it's showing where the skirt is at. So we could, in this case, spread them out where they don't overlap at all, I think. Yeah, so we could spread them out where they don't overlap at all. Um, but we could even, if we wanted to, we could have them overlap like this. Would be okay. This would be okay. Uh, this would be okay, although uh, we'd have the, because the nozzle isn't going to go away over here. Um, but if we overlapped right here, now we, we might have a chance where the, the, not the nozzle, but the other structures around the nozzle, like your cooling fan or something like that, might hit one of these already printed parts. So you can have some overlap, but you don't want to have a lot of overlap, overlap but over the model. The, you can have the gray areas overlap each other because there's nothing actually printed there. And you could turn off that uh, skirt and have it uh, give you some more room that you don't have to overlap. All right, so now I've got four of these. These are set to print one at a time. So let's slice them. And let's preview them. All right. So here's layer one is just this bottom right one. Now, I don't know which order it decides to print them in. Um, there might be a way that you can specify that. It might be, well, I don't know, it's printing the, the copy, one of the copies. So I don't know how it actually decides which order to print them in. I didn't go and look close enough at that. But it will print all of this one. And then it will move over here and print all of this one. So you don't have to worry about traveling between the two. So you're not going to have stringing between the two. Uh, this one's not going to have time to a layer to cool down uh, before it goes to the other one um, and, and get too cool. So this could be useful for a couple of different things. Now, it is limiting in that they can't overlap and also they can't be very tall. Notice my print volume height is much much shorter than it normally is um, that's because not only can the nozzle and the hot end and all the stuff around the nozzle not crash into stuff but the actual axis the the bar itself that holds the x-axis on holds the hot end on and it slides back and forth on it can't get in the way of things um, so it does limit how tall the models can be so that's why these these little coins being really short are, are pretty good for this type of sequential printing. You could do other things. You could set pauses in here and change the colors out if you wanted to, um, so that one is one color, one is another color, and so forth. Um, at, at, I don't know if that would be particularly useful because all that really does is print one model and then change the color and print another one. I guess it keeps everything heated up, so it kind of helps. But um, it's really for if you don't want stringing between the models, like moving back and forth, or if you're trying to print them and you don't want them to cool down too much before you put the next layer on top of them. Um, sometimes they can have delamination problems when they are too cool and you put hot material on top of that and then it cools down again and you put hot material back on top. Um, so sequential printing might be useful. Uh, if nothing else, it's kind of interesting the to see that your printer can have one thing printed on it and then move over and print another thing. Um, let's see, let's get, let's go back to uh, our regular all at once mode here. Oh, I didn't see the time. I think that was 40-ish minutes or so. Let's see, it actually takes longer, it says, to print it this way, I think, or very similar. I don't, I didn't, didn't really look at the time. Actually, now I'm curious, let's see. So 52 minutes for all at once. How long for one at a time?
52 minutes. So it's, it doesn't add any time. All right. In this scenario, there might be other situations where it does. But in this scenario, it doesn't actually take it any longer to print. All right, we're back to one of these things. Um, actually, let's load Pikachu. Let's get rid of this guy. Let's say you're, you're really, this probably wouldn't work with this particular model. I didn't intend for it to, but um, because it does have some need for overhangs and support material. But there is a vase mode in, in Cura. It's not called vase mode. It's called spiralize outer contour. And um, I don't even know if it will slice this. I didn't try it. Let's try. All right. So let's see what we get for a preview. It actually shows all there. So it would try. There is some issues here because I actually have two contours. It doesn't know how to deal with that. But it's completely hollow. So it... It prints the bottom solid, and then it only prints one layer. And if you look, it's a spiral, so it's spiralizing the outer contour. So um, it will go, and actually it looks like this would print. We'd have a little gaps in here, so it looks like, uh, and we're at a thicker, no, we're back at point two. Um, and it's probably going to have some issues over here on the tail. No, the tail looks actually okay. Um, right here. Notice where on the top of his knee, I guess that is, um, it's basically printing in air. That's because normally there'd be some support underneath there to hold that. Um, so this probably would fail right here. So it doesn't work in, in every model. But some models are designed this way. Um, other models can benefit from uh, making just a spiralized outer contour. And it will certainly save time. We went from six hours to one and a half hours. Um, this model probably would fail pretty badly though, particularly over here. The top of his head would probably fail pretty badly uh, up here. Uh, yeah, that looks like it's not gonna, you know, he'd basically have no top on his head. Uh, but as, if you have something more like a vase shape, these spiralized outer contours are a good uh, way to get that. They, they're not as weak as you would think. Certainly they're flexible, but they're not as weak as you might think they would be. Um, it works really well with flexible material where the material itself can flex. And so uh, like a TPU or whatever, um, if you have a model that can be printed uh, with the spiralized base mode, then, uh, and it's already you know flexible because it's thin, then adding the TPU flexibility to it actually makes it um, like a really rigid balloon maybe. So it's uh, it go goes back to its original shape and everything, um, but it is very flexible. Something like this in PLA, well this particular model would just fail, but um, same thing in PLA, um, you, you squish it a little bit and it's probably just gonna crack. Um, but it is a, an interesting way to get a model done quickly. Um, Maybe you're just trying to test out the shape of it and the size of it or whatever without any any structural need at all. It's just got to exist in the space. Um, this might be one way to do it quickly. Um, all right, let's let's turn that off though. I don't don't normally use spiralized outer outer contours or base mode, um, but it is something that I wanted to make sure you knew existed. Um, here's one that. Um, I should have a benchy. I don't have a benchy, but uh, let me see if we can find one real quick. Let's see. Where do I have? Just, just get one off a of Thingiverse. Oh, there's all kinds of benchies now. Let's see. Here's a. Oh, no, that's a. Not the kind I want. Here's, where's a regular old benchy? People have made uh, a lot of fancy ones. Well, we'll just pick one that's more or less normal. Back to here. 
here. Let's get rid of Pikachu. And, um, oh, I, he went into downloads. It's the Iron Throne Binchy, so he's going to have a, a Game of Thrones throne in his captain's chair, I guess. Yeah, it's just in there. All right, so that's not the point, though. Um, oh, and this one sliced really oddly, or, or created like very oddly, but maybe it'll show what I want to show. All right, um, the Z seam. So the Z seam is where um, a layer starts and a new layer begins, right? You, you do one layer at a time, and so they have a starting point and an ending point. Um, and a lot of times where that transition from, you know, the starting and ending uh, will create a little blob of material on your surface. Um, and there's, there's no way for FDM printing to not have a starting point and an ending point. <clears throat> so there are some options here. Um, there's all these. I'm mainly interested in this Z-Seam alignment one. Um, and you can pick a random starting and stopping point so that the blobs, if your printer is really bad at making blobs wherever the uh, starting point is, um, then they will kind of randomize them and spread them out over the model. Um, I don't know that that's the best one. Shortest, not necessarily the best one. I think the sharpest corner, assuming you have something like the Benchy that has sharp corners on it, I think that uh, does a decent job of lining up all those blobs on a sharp corner. So if nothing else, they're easy to sand off. And they might even get completely hidden because they're at a corner. Um, let's see if we can pick up where they're at in here. For benchies, it usually puts them over on this corner. Let's see. I don't know if I can tell without printing it. Um, actually, this one's got a sharp corner elsewhere. Yeah, I can't tell where it actually starts them. Um, but uh, usually it puts them on back, back here. Sometimes it will put them on the bow. And so they'll just kind of all be lined up there. Um, so it's one way to, if you have these blobs, every time your uh, print starts a new layer and ends uh, the previous layer, this is one way the Z seam alignment um, on the sharpest corner, assuming you have some sharp corners in the model, uh, might help hide them. Or like I said, it, it would at least line them up where they're easy to sand off or file off or something. There is another way to get rid of these blobs um, it's, uh, it might even still be in the uh, experimental, but it's called coasting. Yeah, it's in the experimental setting. Um, and what this does is enable coasting is basically when the printer is about to finish a line on a layer. So it's, it's the last line of the wall and it's about to finish it. It will quit extruding for some amount of space. So... Um, this one's based on volume instead of distance, um, but some volume of material in this case, which corresponds to a, a length of like maybe half a millimeter or something like that. And it will um, keep extruding because this works really mainly for a printer like the Ender 3 that has the Bowden tube on it. So there's pressure built up in that tube from the, the extruder, which is remote from the hot end, you know, connected by that tube. And so they don't stop extruding immediately. Now you have settings like retraction to try and suck some of that filament back up and everything. But all of these things take time to happen. And so basically what coasting does is it um, pr tries to predict that, hey, I'm at the end of a line. I, I know I've got some built up pressure in the nozzle and I'm going to quit extruding and let the pressure kind of take care of that last little bit of the line. So you can certainly overdo this. So you have too large of a volume for the coasting volume um, and it can um, leave gaps in your model. But uh, let's, let's turn this on and see if we can see where it uh, puts these coasting marks. Let's see if we can see any of them. I gotta zoom in. So right here. See how there's a gap missing right here? That's coasting. Those three are coasting. Um, so 
it finished this layer right here and it's going to use the residual pressure in the nozzle to fill in this last little bit so it shows up as a gap in the model All these little gaps in the model are where it's coasting um, so on your actual printed model they should be filled in with the um, the residual material that's still kind of oozing out of the print head um, so you certainly want a small vo volume here like if we put I don't know let's do something something really large and slice it well it doesn't show up as actually being much larger gaps in here but you would probably have uh, large gaps in the model now I'm going to change that back before I forget and leave it off so this is an experimental uh, some printers just don't behave well with the coasting uh, but it is another way to get rid of those blobs that might be happening at the uh, end of a line on a layer um, let's see are there any other oh there's some other fun ones um, Let's, let's get the coin back. This one's not a fun one. This one's actually a useful one. Let's, where's, where is he at? It's not any of those. Um, I think I have him over. He no, he's on the desktop. I can put him, yeah, there he is. All right. So let's say we wanted this coin. This is the one that um, we printed a while back for the dual color printing, but we want him smaller. So let's scale it down to 60. Per oh, let's turn uniform scaling back on. That's one thing that you have to be careful about. You change some settings and they are persistent and you might forget that you changed them. All right, so we made him thinner. Uh, we're at point two, let's slice. All right, and then preview. Notice, now coasting is not on, this is not coasting, but notice that I have some gaps in the wall here. Looks like there's some gaps over here um, this is because these lines, when I scaled it down, or maybe when I modeled it to begin with, if I wasn't careful, they're thinner than the 0.4 millimeter nozzle. And so the slicer says, well, you can't print anything smaller than 0.4 millimeters because that's how big the nozzle is on this printer. Um, and so it just doesn't print them. There is a, stand, uh, a setting for thin walls called print thin walls. <laughs> and it will, if you check that and we slice, even though they're thinner than what uh, the printer thinks is able to do, it will just say, all right, I'm going to, there's a wall here. I don't think it's going to come out the way you wanted it, but I'm going to print it. Now, it's not perfect. You can kind of see some you know, oddities in here, but it at least did fill in those walls here and over here. So um, that print thin, wall, thin walls feature might be if you have some really thin walls that uh, just aren't slicing because they're too thin, uh, there is a print thin walls option here under shell that will force them to print. Now, it doesn't do it perfectly every time. Um, you can kind of see in the zero here on 20 that there's a, still a gap that it didn't know what to do with. But it did print more of the walls than what we had before. So that's, that's another useful one. Um, it's really better to design your model so that uh, the thinnest features are at least twice as big as your nozzle diameter, but that's not always possible. So this is one way you might be able to get them to print. They'd still be weak. Um, let's see, let's do three more and uh, call it a day. So here's, here's one, ironing. Enable ironing, what this does is now, and it may not work very well on this particular model, um, but it goes back over, you can kind of see this little, thin crosshatch pattern here, it's going back over the top layers of your model and ironing them. So it just uses the nozzle um, and it will try to flatten them out. You know, the it works really well with PLA. Some materials don't work so well with this, um, but it will try to go in and basically use the nozzle as an iron to flatten out the uh, top layer so it zigzags across well you can do different patterns concentric or zig zigzag I think the zigzag works better but um, you can set that it's only on the very top layer so it wouldn't do these down here so if we sliced it now it should only be on that very top layer and not here so it only happened on this yellow pieces 
Um, and it'll and it will it will flatten them out pretty well, um, and it makes them look like you've sanded them sort of. There's actually sometimes this uh, feature is called I think neo sanding or something like that. Um, in cure, it's called ironing. There's one called combing that is similar. Combing mode, um, usually within infill. What this does is it goes in and when the nozzle has to move from one place to another without extruding material, it will try to make those movements inside, well, whatever you say, either not on the skin or only in the infill or not at all off is what the default is, you know. Um, or you have all or whatever. But uh, it will try to only move the nozzle places where if it did uh, have a string that the string is like inside the model so it doesn't leave all this stringy stuff on the outside of the model or it doesn't drag blobs towards the outside of the surface um, so that's combing and then one last one that's just kind of fun is fuzzy so i don't know what that'll do to this model here but um, it kind of gives a, a bumpy <laughs> yeah it gives a very bumpy texture for this guy because um, this is really small to begin with actually it's smaller than it normally is um, but you can maybe we can reduce that a little bit and uh, it works good on models that uh, you want to have a little bit of texture on the outside but basically it takes that outer line wherever the outer lines are and it randomizes the movement a little bit of the nozzle so it makes it a little shaky um, on these I would not recommend it on something that you wanted to have straight lines like a coin but something that um, like actually this would probably be really good with the uh, Pikachu model you'd have a fuzzy Pikachu let's go find him again it might take forever for it to slice it is kind of resource intensive to, to slice uh, with the fuzzy mode let's just see how long it takes it's not too bad and then you can tweak the settings only on the outside skin probably is the a useful one and then you can kind of tweak how uh, how far out the fuzziness is. But now he would look like kind of a fuzzy fuzzy Pikachu. So particularly if you have a uh, model that should have some kind of texture on the skin, but you don't want to model that texture in, um, this is one way to get that texture on there. Um, now it's not necessarily a pattern, it is random, but it will give a texture to a surface. Um, so it's a fun one to try around with. Um, and you know up close it looks kind of weird but actually when you print them out um, and you've got these settings small enough to where they're not overpowering the the model itself and just hiding all the features then it actually comes out pretty good all right so those were a bunch of different features there are plenty of others like I said there are hundreds of features in here those are some of the ones that are kind of useful and kind of fun um, to get your models up just to the next little level of whatever you're trying to do. Um, so hopefully there, some of those will be useful. We'll come back Monday and hopefully I've done some more on our blaster and we're about ready to finish up the sequence of courses that will, or classes that will fall into this course. And then I don't know, we'll move on to something else. Um, all right, I will see you on Monday.